Martin Heidegger, now this, this talk in some respects is incredibly difficult because I remember when the uh, elitist and Jewish academic George Steiner was asked to do the Fontana Modern Masters on Heidegger, it was because a long series of Oxbridge academics couldn't do it. They basically couldn't reduce the extraordinary complexity of, in particular, this work being at the time 200 pages because Fontana Modern Masters, as you know, is a student's sort of quote-unquote cheat primer, the sort of thing that people look up on the internet now. And to reduce Heidegger to that is slightly ridiculous, but you also have to provide a sort of middling and upper middling foregrounding for people to come into the theory anyway. Otherwise, they'll be at sea. Now, what people do when they write sort of Times Literary Supplement, never mind Sunday Times articles about somebody like Heidegger, is they basically talk about his politics. They talk about whether or not he had a mistress. They talk about his early Catholicism. They talk about wraparound and biographical matters because the theory is amongst the most difficult metaphysical theory written in the last century. Probably Adorno and Sartre are on the ultra-left, both of whom cross over with certain areas that Heidegger was concerned with, Sartre biographically, never mind anything else, and Heidegger are amongst the most complicated theorists that one can ever imagine. So before we start on this talk, we have to look at what's happened to Western philosophy in the last hundred years. Now, for those who read the philosophy at tertiary level in our universities, and tertiary education has been so degraded in many respects through egalitarian discourse that it's almost meaningless, but for those who do, they know there's two great clusters in Western academic philosophy, so-called Anglo-American philosophy and so-called, but essentially actual, European and continental philosophy. We grow up, whether we like it or not, because even the Tony Blairs of this world are actually subliminally influenced by these ideas in an empirical, naturalist, factually oriented, slightly anti-theoretical current which comes from our alleged and swadidant enlightenment. And we come out of an essentially an anti-theoretical and an anti-metaphysical discourse, which is why something as unbelievably outre as this is literally outside of British and Anglo-concentric thinking in all sorts of ways. For a long time it was said that being in time would be untranslatable, and this wasn't translated until 62. And don't forget, the book was written in the 20s, and it's translated by two academics, so it's sort of two for one, with Blackwell's, a sort of generalised Oxbridge publisher. Now, what is continental philosophy trying to do, and why does Anglo-American philosophy think it's meaningless? Because these are questions that can't be answered, and therefore shouldn't even be asked, in a Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein in way of looking at things. Basically, Heidegger is trying, through semi-atheistic and allegedly secular discourse to arrive at certain ultimate spiritual truths grounded in pure philosophy and in pure thinking about thinking, even thinking about the thinking of thinking. And he is trying to prove certain cardinal things that in many ways gifted adolescents ask, but often as they sort of often atrophy into adulthood and early maturity, they fall away from. Most people ask, what's life for? Is there a God? Is there ultimate purpose? What is death about? Will anything happen to me that can be acknowledged as existing before I die, that impinges upon this cardinal event? Why are most people completely oblivious to these issues and are terrified and are often in a state of mild anxiety if they come up in general discourse? Now, Heidegger is trying to reach real conclusions, grounded philosophical conclusions about these cardinal matters. Because he believes that Western metaphysics, and this is an incredibly arrogant statement really, he believed that Western metaphysics had gone wrong for 2,500 years of falsity and inauthenticity in relation to the primal nature of being, which he believes is even a category within the notion of being, which he calls being in being. Now what's being? Um, the science, quote-unquote, of being in abstract philosophy is called ontology. And all of his work is about ontology. Now, this slogan behind me, which um, Troy has kindly put up, is in part a conceit, because it says, my sin, Heidegger, and death's ontology. We can't really have an ontology of death, but you can have an ontology of life. But his whole point is to place 
life as understood as concrete being and as phenomena before death. Heidegger is essentially a religious thinker, but he wants to root theoretical and theological energies through pure intellectuality. Why so? Because it is a way into intellectual understanding in the 20th century. Most of the cardinal ideas of the 20th century impinge upon him, and he was taught phenomenology at university by Herschel, to whom being in time is dedicated. In the sort of epigraph, straight frontal page, he says, dedicated to Edmund Herschel in friendship and admiration. Uh, Black Forest, 8th of April, 1926. Now, many people, sort of undergraduates, people who go on Channel 4 documentaries, would say that Martin Heidegger is an existentialist. And he influenced enormously that school, but in actual fact he's not an existentialist, hence the endless intellectual complication. He's as far removed as that was being tangential to it as one can possibly imagine. Now, he is a radical essentialist of the most primary and foundational form. Most of the contemporary theory that's influenced Western University professors and other intellectuals in the last 30 years is based on a particular type of existentialism, which is designed in a way to get rid of this sort of material even before they start thinking. The idea is, is that existence is all there is, and existence foregrounds essence. There is no prior essence. There are no ontological variants which could be said to be true before us. Essentially, there is, put crudely and in sign editorial terms, if you can even describe Heidegger in such cultural proximity, they're saying that God is not just dead, but has, was always dead, and was always a mistake. And even the admission of his existence, or partial existence, was based on a question that shouldn't be asked, because it was epistemologically false, even in the asking of it. Epistemology is the science or way of understanding how one should think, thinking about thinking, if you like. Because in this type of thinking, before you have a thought, you must rather like a surgeon, make sure that your tools are all right in order to operate. So you have to think about the thinking you're going to initiate before you even start thinking. Now, most left-wing ideas are based upon the idea that we're a tabula rasa, that we're a sheet of paper, that society is, that you can write upon it as you want and as you will, that we're the product of economics or we're the product of social forces or interconnections of the two. There might be a bit of a biology, but it's so mediated through socio-economic concerns that it's lost sight of. Certainly, there are no prior truths to us and our existence. Hence, Sartre's famous essay, which was designed to bring leftist students and a whole generation of them, many of whom are prominent in the media now and so on, in the Western world, into a particular type of thinking, he wrote an essay called Existentialism is a Humanism, because ultimately, in a sense, it is. Although, paradoxically, there have been plenty of right-wing existentialists. They believe that existence precedes essence. Essence is just an idea, is a ghost, is a spook in the machine, is that which is prior. It's that which all modern theory rejected when the modern world replaced the medieval world. And in some respects, although it's a very crude analysis, Heidegger is a supercharged modern who is a return of radically medieval ways of looking at the world, at meaning, at purpose, at will, and at existence in existence as clarified essence. So in a way, he is trying, scribbling away in this chalet that he had, made of wood in the Black Forest, to confirm the existence of God, basically. That's what he's trying to do with this enormous amount of theory. When post-structuralism, so-called, became the cardinal intellectual discourse of our universities, pretty much in the 1980s, 1990s, and subsequently, those theories are based upon the idea which radicalizes even the existentialist project of the 50s and 60s. And this is that there is no essential foundation to meaning. I remember a Marxist university professor I know quite well, he teaches at some upgraded poly, which is now called a university in London, Malcolm Evans, who wrote a book about Shakespeare called Signifying Nothing, which is a quote from Macbeth, of course, so there's clever interweaving of text going on here. But he basically believes that essentialism is dangerous 
Because, of course, although your average socialist worker party activist, and there's few of them left, would even think in these terms, it is a totally rival and totally discontinuous and totally oppositional way of thinking. They believe, they begin with man in his predicament. And the only way to get out of that predicament is to change one's environment which creates the nature of that predicament. Heidegger's view is that everything is prior. Everything is prior. And death is before you. And death, in accordance with essentially his religious nature, is what life is about. In other words, life is about preparing yourself for inexistence. Now, one of the sort of comments that goes across this sort of constellation, which could be said to be Heidegger, is Jean-Paul Sartre, who did his uh, thesis in Germany, partly during the Nazi period. Sartre, this rather sort of short-sighted, ugly man, stooping around, running about, didn't seem to know what was going on in Germany at this period. Indeed, there were circles of the left in post-war France who held it against Sartre that he actually studied in Germany during this period, influenced by these sorts of ideas. Now, Sartre takes these ideas in another direction. So he doesn't have a prior essence that there are things like beauty with a big B, justice with a big J, truth with a big T, and so on, that exist prior to man. He believes that everything is unknown prior to specific consciousness. But you authenticate yourself in the possibility of being by confronting nothingness and filling the emptiness with volition. In his case, by choosing to be an extreme leftist. Life is utterly meaningless. But one chooses a course for one's life and for one's discourse. And this led him from myopic apoliticism and moping around in German libraries in the 1930s through to Maoism, essentially, because he basically ended up in a sort of Maoist sect before he died in the 1970s. Something which, because Pol Pot of all people passed through some of those Parisian salons in the 1970s, listening to people like Chris Daver and these other post-structuralist theorists, has rather doomed Sartre in post-war and after his death terms. Because you can't claim existentialism as a humanism when one of your moral pupils turns out to be Pol Pot. That's been a bit difficult, you see. But you have this extraordinary radicalism in the examples of these two men. Sartre ends up with Mao, put crudely, and Heidegger ends up with Hitler. Because both of them, if you like, begin thinking cardinally about the values of our civilization, which, when you think about it logically, would lead them to why some of the most radical conclusions, socio-politically and ideologically, which are possible. Because... This type of intellectuality, and I'm going to read certain sections of it, because there is a pretension always to talking about people like Heidegger without dealing with what we'll call the hardcore. You've actually got to look at the material, which is written in a sedentary way, but is written in a sense in accordance with the notion of intellectual fury. It's the belief that all of life and all of meaning can be revealed through mental processes, which I don't believe is true, but it's a, it's a heroic attempt to do this. And this sort of language is virtually a system of thinking which has more, in relation, has more relationship with artistic ways of describing things, actually, because Heidegger's theory is something you have to experience. Here is a man dwelling upon ultimate questions of whether there is an essence in an essence, of what it means to be you, or this table, or anything that phenomenologically exists or are there realms above us, or beneath us, or around us? And how can you answer a moral question with an affirmative statement? Wittgenstein's point in Tractatus and After is that ultimately you can't answer a morally affirmative statement because to do so is meaningless outside language, and language is all that exists, and language is given even only a partial meaning through context. There's a famous and funny story with Wittgenstein where he's ferociously berating an American visiting professor at Cambridge and says, you can't make a affirmative moral statement, and he's waving a poker in his face. And the university professor replies, here's an affirmative moral statement, don't wave pokers in the faces of visiting professors. And Wittgenstein hurls the uh, poker into the fire and storms out of the room in a, in, a, in a rant. But these attempts, abstract and very radical though they are, always, like Icarus in a sense, go up and then come down again. Because my, my words, every politician and every pundit, no matter how low level, 
no matter how 200 times beneath this sort of discourse they are, is actually replicating ideas that have come from somewhere and are going somewhere. The reason why, is, you know, you walk around London today, the world is as it is, is ideological in the broadest of senses. Because a man who has any sort of belief becomes uh, the equivalent of 50 men in action. And Heidegger was a man whose action was theory in this purely Germanic way. I met a German intellectual once and he said, ah, you're an intellectual. And he sits down and looks right into your eyes and you begin the theory. This is a totally un-British sort of way of behaving because there's no concept of irony in a way. But this idea that you achieve truth through almost the violence of intellectuality, which in a way uh, Heidegger evinces. Now let's read something from Being and Time. And now, Being and Time is divided into two books, essentially. The first one is an explanation of the question of the meaning of being, the necessity, structure, and priority of the question of being. This is whether we can even talk about the nature of talking about the book. We have the necessity for explicitly restating the question of being. We have the formal structure of the question of being. We have the ontological priority of the question of being. And we have the ontical priority of the question of being. That takes him 32 pages before he's even started. You've got to clear away all the, grub, all the sort of refuse in your garden before you start, basically. Part one is the interpretation of that sign in terms of temporality. That means the interpretations of being in terms of time. And the explication of time as the transcendental horizon for the question of being. Then there's another section about being in the world in general as the basic state of that sign. Then there's a section on the worldhood of the world. The worldhood of the world, by which he means, is the world as we appear? Can we prove that you're actually there? Because it's actually very difficult from first principles to prove common sense. That I'm speaking to you, that I'm not speaking to myself, that it's a vision, that I'm talking about things that are endlessly solipsistic, in pure mental processes without being empirical, because this type of theory believes that empiricism distorts because you go down to matter, so you must keep it totally at a theoretical level. It's actually quite difficult to prove the idea that everything isn't an idea, and that even addressing you in this way is an idea, and so on. Being in the world as being within and bringing oneself to the they, this is the idea that one approaches the possibility of semi-existence in another, theoretically, before one gets there. Then one has being in, hyphenated, as such. Germans love these, uh, the intellectual Germans love these little as suches and so on. Care as the being of Dastein. Now this is the self-reflexiveness of the possibility of being in being. What does he mean by being in being? He really means the presence of God in life, really. Deep down, he, in my view, never left the Jesuits. He trained him intellectually. And his thesis was on Duns Scotus. This, the idea that everything is essentially foregrounded before one gets there, theoretically. Now here's the second book, Division 2 second book, Dasein and Temporality. Dasein's possibility of being a whole and being towards death, which is the real point, to place man in full understanding of it before death. Now, there's always with this sort of theory possibly a sort of alienation effect. But the way to look at it is there are a few moments of profundity in most individuals' lives. But one of them is that period when one is probably pretty conscious that one is waiting for death. And it's going to happen to all of us, you and me. And in some ways, the way to overcome the sort of innate philistism that exists about this pure, pure theory is to put yourself in that position. <coughs> because Heidegger's work is a man in early life in full consciousness of radical mental gifts, thinking about what it means to die before you get there, responding at the level of emotion. Although I believe personally that all theory is physically based and comes out of the emotions as part of one's physicality. Let's not intrude my ideas too much. Another section is Dasein's attestation of an authentic potentiality for being and resoluteness. Another section is Dasein's authentic potentiality for being a whole and temporality as the ontological meaning of a care. Then there's a section on temporality and everydayness. <coughs> 
by this time we got up to page 421, by the way. Then there's a section on temporality and historicality, and then there's a section on temporality and within timeness as the source of the ordinary conception of time. Then there's some dealings with other theorists who are rather sort of brushed away at the end, Hegel in particular. The last section of all, which is um, section 83, around pages 436 to 486, is the existential temporal analysis of Dasein and the question of fundamental ontology as to the meaning of being in general. This is the moment when he wants to place man before death, self-aware of the nature of authentic existence. As a critique of all of this sort of material, Adorno, in some respects, his chief ideological nemesis on the other side, wrote a book called The Jargon of Authenticity, which is an attack upon this type of thinking. Adorno is one of the key thinkers in what's called Western Marxism and the Frankfurt School. Now, here is a, a section on death, because it's all essentially about death. Underlying this biological ontical exploration of death, that just means a biological exploration of death, is a problematic that is ontological that concerns the science of being. We still have to ask how the ontological essence of death is defined in terms of that of life. In a certain way, this has always been decided already in the ontical investigation of death. Such investigations operate with preliminary concepts of life and death, which have been more or less clarified back in the last 290 pages, which I'll forbear from reading out. These preliminary conceptions need to be sketched out as the ontology of Dasein, which is being in being. Within the ontology of Dasein, which is superordinate to an ontology of life, the existential analysis of death is in turn subordinate to a characterization of Dasein's basic state. The ending of that, uh, which lives... Uh, pardon, this is very, very difficult to read, isn't it? even up here. The ending of that which lives we have called perishing. Dasein too has its death of the kind appropriate to anything that lives. And basically, he's asking here, does what traditionalist orders have called the soul survive death? And it has, not in ontical uh, isolation, but as co-determined by its primordial kind of being. Insofar as this is the case, that sign too can end without authentically dying. Though on the other hand, qua that sign, it does not simply perish. We designate this intermediate phenomenon as its demise. And then there's a large footnote, which I'll forbear from going into, because it's printed in point six, I think. Let the term dying stand for that way of being in which that sign is towards its death. Auxiliary footnote. Accordingly, we must say that that sign never perishes. That sign, however, can demise only as long as it is dying. So he's, call, he's talking about the death of the concept of the soul, which is self-aware of the possibility of that moment. Okay? Medical and biological investigation into demising can obtain results which may even become significant ontologically if the basic orientation for an existential interpretation of death has been made secure. Aha! Or must sickness and death in general, even from a medical point of view, notice medical point of view, physical stuff, which we keep out of sight, uh, be primarily conceived as existential phenomena. The first thing that strikes you about this is his attitude towards death. You walk around the death ward in a hospital, you know, they're all about to give out. Most people's response is physical and emotional, the one and the other. He regards that as bourgeois deviation, even as filth. Always keep your theory before you, because that's how you apprise the nature of that which is real as against that which is mere appearance, and that which is governed by dread. In the 1960s, the counterculture that had many tendencies, which ultimately tended overwhelmingly to the left, regardless of this, had the notion that... <sighs> I've lost my thread now. Um, in the 60s, there were many, many countercultural tendencies. But they had the notion that life was not as it should be or could be that there needed to be a spiritual dimension to human beings that had been lost sight of given the collapse of the Christian religion. And I take it as unarguable that in our civilization in the last hundred years, in accordance with what it once was in the West, largely with the odd exception, individual and group, the Christian religion has collapsed. And it's collapsed amongst the most advanced thinkers of our civilization and racial or ethnic group from early in the 19th century. Or at least they were aware of the possibility of its mass collapse 
long before it became a sociological phenomenon. This is why this theory, which ultimately has had much more impact in theology than it has in philosophy, has been put in this particular way. Now, let's have... Now, this book goes on for 460 pages. And when the Renaissance occurred in our thinking, one of the great criticism of the philosophical schools that preceded it, of which Dunscotus was an accredited master, was that they were dealing with things that could never be proved at this level of reality, even theoretically. And the slogan that's used is that they were debating the number of angels that can dance on the head of a pin. And it was all utterly pointless. And we had to get away from all of that. Now, Heidegger wants to go back there to up to a point. But in actual fact, he wants to go further back. He wants to go back to the pre-Socratics. He wants to go back to the Sophists. He wants to go back to the original and primary Greek thinkers that begin the process two and a half thousand years ago, which is why Nietzsche obsessed him. Because if you like, Nietzsche stands halfway between this radical essentialist stroke quasi-religious thinking that there is before you nothing but God and God in all and God for all and you're part of him. Which is if you sacralize this language begins to make sense of what being is, what being in being is, what being in being before being is and so on. It's if you like a rerouted theological languages. There's that position. And prior traditionalists who had right-wing views largely accord philosophically and psychologically with this area. Nietzsche, who's a figure who obsessed Heidegger, of course, and who has this enormous theoretical explosion at the end of the 19th century, just preceding the emergence of people like Herschel, Jaspers and Heidegger in early 20th century Germanic thinking at a high philosophical level. Don't forget, Anglo-American philosophy almost denies the possibility of metaphysics. Bertrand Russell would say, if he was sat at the back, which is a bit difficult considering he's been a corpse for about 30 years, but he would say it's all meaningless. It's an interesting talk, but it's about things that can't be proved at any level and is therefore pointless. Because your view is as good as his, as good as so-and-so's, the only difference is people can put it better or worse. But there can be no grounded truth that I can grasp and put social practice and purpose to. Now, Nietzsche stands half between halfway between the left existentialist view, that there's nothing prior, that put very simply, we make it up as we go along. Baudrillard, a French intellectual, wrote a book in the 1990s saying that the first Gulf War was just a computer game. Didn't happen. Didn't happen, it's just a discourse. All those cluster bombs and stealth bombs and so on. It was just a fantasy of a televisual age. One man's discourse, you see. In an age of extreme relativism, which is the almost opposite of this absolutist theory, totalitarian theory, which is actually mentally what it is, we see the division between what exists now and the reasons for some of the very controversial, certainly in mainstream, political choices that Heidegger made in the middle of his life in Germany in the 30s. Now Nietzsche's position is that there is a prior, there is an essence, but Nietzsche is a partial to semi-absolute existential thinker, because Nietzsche's contribution to modernity and to modern intellectual thinking is there may be things which are prior, but we don't know what they are, and we have to test them through struggle, through life, through will and purposiveness, and various levels of what he called wills of power, which he believed was the basis of all lived existence. So, Nietzsche says God is dead. Part of say he's a militant atheist, but partly to say that the idea of God in the minds of men has died, which means that theoretically it may not have completely died, but is in a point of collapse, because the point is to test and to rearrange, and you put up a view and I will attack it, because life is struggle, and in that struggle comes out the possibility of meaning. Nietzsche would say, there is a truth, but I don't know it yet, drive buy me another drink. There is a degree to which Ontological circumstances cannot be completely proved but are not rendered prior meaningless. Which is why Nietzsche approaches nihilism. The belief that there is no purpose and no values and no constraints and no morals that aren't purely human and that there is nothing outside. Which of course makes it very difficult to run any sort of a civilization because there are no lines. <coughs> 
And Nietzsche stands halfway between what you might call this existential leftist praxis and Heidegger. Nietzsche has become extremely fashionable on the left in the last 30 years. And there's lots of postmodernist books, people like Deleuze and Guattari and these sorts of people, who love the element of Nietzsche that tears down by come as a destroyer. Because in order to create, you've got to destroy first. You've got to level off a bit. There's ruins around you, so you give them a bit of a push. All of Nietzsche's thinking before Zarathustra, when he begins to vouchsafe his own view, if you like, is largely a tearing down. Tearing down of the normative nature of ethics in the genealogy of morals. Tearing down of the idea of truth itself. An erection of science in works like the dawn, or the joyful wisdom stroke the gay science, and then the tearing down of the idea of science. A playing up of certain Darwinian and evolutionary ideas, which Nietzsche is actually quite suspicious of, because he doesn't think that life is, and circumstances are linear at all. He believes they're circular, and everything that was comes back again. He thinks Darwin and Darwinists are cretinous materialists and shallow optimists. Look at the people around you. Are they progressing and moving upwards, or are they just dullards led by a few people at the top who manipulate them? Now, Heidegger made a radical, possibly the most radical choice, philosophically and politically, in the century that's just passed. Admittedly, he was living in Germany at a time when, if the left liberal consensus would have it, the most controversial regime in the 20th century came to power. Now, if you were in other races and other societies, you would actually refute that. You'd say Stalin's or Lenin's or Mao's or various other regimes were more important. You could argue that the most important regime in the 20th century is the American one. But put all that on another table for today. Heidegger decided in 1933 to join the Nazi Party, to join the National Socialist German Workers' Party, and gave lectures for a year in his university in full Nazi uniform. And was involved with all of the other party gauleiters and other figures in his area, to the shock and horror and consternation of much of the academic elite uh, that he was associated with. And don't forget that Heidegger did this for purely speculative and theoretical reasons. Heidegger had no concern with doctrines of race, no concerns with doctrines of conspiracy, no concerns with politics at all. Politics was irrelevant in relation to placing man before death, which was what life was about. And what he liked about this movement was that he thought it was a primordial movement that was bringing back, almost in an occultistic way, the partiality towards death, that in some ways it was bringing back the ancient world with modern technology. That's why he reached out to it. Now, he regarded democracy just like middle-brow secular humanism, as a deviation. Because in a sense, his nature is so sort of primordially prior and religious that he considers almost all normal life to be irrelevant. Family, having a good time, pleasure. Pleasure as a principle for life, which in liberal theory is cardinal. The American Constitution talks about liberty, talks about property, talks about happiness. Heidegger doesn't think the purpose of life is happiness. The purpose of life is death and facing ontology. But he doesn't put it in the vocabulary that you must fall before the one who is on the cross, who bleeds for us. Because in a sense, Heidegger just increasingly sees those as forms, as metaphors for metaphors, as stuff that needs to be put out of the way someone can concentrate on the cardinal things of life, death, spirituality, and the possible existence of God. God, as he told Paul Chelan when they met in 67, has always been with me. And Chelan's interesting, of course, as a Jewish poet who wrote in German, for which he was condemned by his own group, and converted to Catholicism because of the Heidegger's influence. And that was not, not a sectarian influence, because Heidegger was totally uninterested in what sect people were in, and so on. These are all forms that have no importance. And in some ways, there's a great paradox because Heidegger's thinking is so purely, transcendently extreme that he's one of the few figures where the pagan-Christian split I'm collapsing into the screen, aren't I? The pagan-Christian split in our civility doesn't really mean anything to him. This is one of the things that interests me very much about him. That uh, with this right-wing group, for example, a few Christians turned up early, they went, 
and it's largely pagan in orientation, uh, in the New Rites in Europe and so on, you have this very great split between the two. Heidegger's almost uh, totally concerned with those things because the forms that people worship being in being through are incidental to placing man before ontological prerequisite. His view is you base life and society upon the profound thinking that will impinge upon a man of full consciousness, not politically debilitated, before his moment of death. And that's why he joined the Nazi party. That's why virtually no one could understand why he joined it. Because he was totally sort of unorthodox in ideological terms, because he had very little interest in that. After a year, he... So he sort of realised that, um, one, probably, they, at a crude level, they didn't understand what he was on about. Two, that he was having to make political decisions in the university and the library and its use and something he didn't agree with. And he fell away. And he left the party then and continued to, to um, teach in the university until 1945. In 1945, he was prescribed by uh, denazification tribunals that were set up in the Western Allied Zones. Now, he was forbidden from teaching in post-war Germany, even though all sorts of people had him as a guest lecturer, so they used to get, get round it that way. And you had this strange situation where he became a sort of moral and spiritual leper in post-war Germany, and yet he was extremely respected. So Dr. Heidegger, Professor Heidegger, was everywhere, and at the same time didn't even have a university post. And there's all sorts of interesting things, because Herschel taught him, but because Herschel was a Jew, he was banned from the university library. But after the war, Heidegger was banned from the library, and Jaspers wrote to educational authorities in Germany saying he shouldn't be given the post. So you have all of this as well. But there was a play a couple of weeks ago, actually, on the BBC by John Banville, an Irish writer, about Heidegger, that was very interesting. And it's a dramatisation because all dramatists are interested in dialectic, they're interested in two minds, if it's a theoretical play of any sort, two minds coming together that disagree, and the tension and the charge and the flow of energy that occurs between those two minds, and whether you can make a narrative out of it that can be listened to from beginning to end. And it's this talk in his hut in the Black Forest, because very interestingly, there is almost inevitably a monastic element to Heidegger. Heidegger goes in, into the woods, in primal inner Germany, to sit there in the middle of this forest and dwell upon death and write a book of 450 pages of um, probably of, to certain Anglo-Saxon minds, sheer intellectual torture virtually, in order to get nearer to the truth that is the truth that is the truth that will not set you free but release you to die with some dignity because that's the only truth that matters. And there's a sort of um, divine element to it in a way, because it's so near to the inexpressible. Um, artistically, of course, in a blowback sense, it's had an enormous influence on novelists in Germany like Hermann Brock and these sorts of things. He wrote The Death of Virgil, and he wrote a book called The Sleepwalkers and so on. And this extraordinary capacity for intellectual abstraction that many German writers have, that they begin with a sort of a, a relatively straightforward narrative, and so they learn chop into ultimate speculative questions, very much influenced by this type of theory. But I don't think people who are illiberal can understand the shock in liberal intellectual elitist circles of a man like Heidegger joining the Nazi party. It is it's actually slightly emotionally difficult to describe it. It is from the sort of view of BBC sort of culture. It is the worst thing, and not just the worst thing, but the the beyond the worst that one, can, one could do. This man of supreme intellectual gifts, dwelling alone in his Shavian hut in the woods, dwelling on the ontology of death in life, in death in life, in death in life, you see what I mean, joins what they consider to be a sort of barbarous wrecking crew. And they're appalled. They're utterly morally appalled. And since the war, people have not really known what to do with Heidegger at all. And because, in a sense, his theory is an attempt to bring back a different version of the West civilization, uh, most people who were on the side politically that he associated with, albeit for a period, don't really know how to make use of him either, in a strange sort of way. That's why he's this sort of illicitable figure. It's noticeable in Thomas Schlafsunik's book on the New Right, for instance. Um, 
How do you in a way can't be integrated? It's a sort of cigarette on the paper that burns through to the other side. He really is in a zone on his own. And what's he trying to do? He's trying to see whether human beings can live authentically. There's a moment in Nietzsche's letters early on in his theoretical course, development, prognosis, after the first text, um, Birth of Tragedy, when he describes seeing a goat herd killing a goat on a hill. I think it's in Italy. And it's what James Joyce would call an epiphany. It's a moment of total, in his terms, authentication and realisation. It's a poetic moment. It's what certain natures call a perfect moment. A moment that certain consciousnesses will look at before they die as the one moment that was perfect. The sky and the goat and the man and the soil and the sun. And it's essentially, it's a religious moment. It's a sort of cosmo faith moment in a way. And Heidegger's point is to get people to experience such moments, which is why he writes this enormous theory to try and intellectually prepare people for the possibility of having such moments. Which is why, of course, when people try and stimulate themselves to have such moments, they chant, they sing, they starve themselves, they go without, they live aesthetically, they do things to alter consciousness. In a sense, he just deals with pure consciousness because he doesn't almost relate to the physical level at all. But it is an attempt to go back to what many Western and Indo-European theorists had believed was cardinal at the beginning of Greek culture. It's Nietzsche's view and it's other people's view, the, the Greek tragedians, the great three, Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, that there is a quote-unquote decadence. That in a sense, Aeschylus is the most hieratic, the most removed from every day, the most transcendental, the most er ascending Sophocles is not a humanist by what he means. This is the manner of the Theban plays, of course. But it's a step down from that sense of mystery, that sense of sort of sheer awe. We now live in a society without any sense of the sacred at all, as de Benoit has pointed out. It's virtually void. And a level down in this trajectory involving the Greek tragic writers is Euripides. He's hardly writing soap opera, but where the gods and the goddesses are seen almost, if not level with human beings, then as superhumans who are just a couple of levels up, but they relate to each other, they fight with each other, they make love to each other, and all this, thing, all this sort of thing, in a way which is recognisably human-esque. And in a way, if you could metaphoricise it, because with theory like this, that's all you really can do, certainly in a talk of this nature. Those prior moments when Aeschylus looks at the divine, because don't forget Western theatre begins with religious ritual and gradually separates itself out. It begins with a monologue. And then Aeschylus has the idea that this is going on a bit too long, so we'll split it. We'll have a duologue and the two consciousnesses talk to each other. And in that you have the tension with which you can sustain drama in our culture, in any culture. Now, in this theatricalization of this meeting in the hut in the woods where he wrote Being in Time and where he wrote other books on Greek tragedy and on Nietzsche. Chelan and Heidegger have this talk and this is Banville dreaming but this type of theory is actually quite close to forms of artistic creation, to forms of higher non-entertainment based spiritual creation in art forms. And then says, why did you join the Nazi party? And Heidegger replies, because they were the one movement of the 20th century that in my terms had a tragic view of life. That had a view of life which is actually the motif and the inner essence, that's I, of the Greek tragedians taken up to date two and a half thousand years later. And I think that's essentially a truthful statement. He gave an interview to the Spiegel's Bible magazine after his death, in the sense that it was recorded before his death, but could only be published as part of his will and settlement after his demise. I think it was published about three, four weeks after he died. In which case, and they asked him, 
because it was a very adversarial interview while he was alive, post-dated, as I say, about why he joined, why he did this, why he did that, and so on. And in actual fact, there's a lot of evasion and attempts at explication and uh, bringing in all the usual things. And even though political correctness wasn't a buzzword then, he's in some ways playing games. He was, he's responding, he's like a politician on the defensive. But in actual fact, as often with art, in my view, you can cut to the truth suddenly, through all sorts of layers, even if the person never said it, it can actually illuminate because it crystallizes in a form the value of something. And when he says to Shalan, with no one there in this fantasy, because Shalan didn't go and see him in that hut for nothing, just so he could put his name in Heidegger's signature book, I've been up to the professor's lodge. You know, it's not, it's not people at this sort of level don't do those sorts of things. He wanted to know why, uh, as George Steiner said, one of, if not the most advanced theoretical mind of the Western civilization in the 20th century adopted this particular course. And he did it because he believed that you cannot have a society where death has no meaning, because life has no meaning. And you cannot have a society which bases itself upon the absence of the religious urge. However you define that urge, and whatever system you use. Because if you do the reverse, you will end up with a society which has two values beyond subsistence. And that was in, could be seen in the title of a grubby play produced in London a couple of years ago called Shopping and Fornication. Yeah. So that is all that life is. If you do not have spiritual levels based upon that. People will always be completely divided about the forms and the language that they use to talk about cardinal matters, but in a way, in a quite moving way, really, Heidegger is attempting to get people to face in early modernity what it means to have a civilization and not to be human, but to live with profound and real meaning. Uh, there's no doubt that this uh, theoretical postulation and this extreme abstraction is quite alien to elements of the Western civilization, certainly our own quadrant of it during the last couple of hundred years. But it is an attempt to place, to not to aestheticize life, but to place life ultimately at the service of God even and most especially for people who either don't believe in him or can only approach such numinance through endless tears of theory. Thank you very much. Have we any questions? I don't know how. Thank you. I've noticed that leftists systematically, completely misunderstand what Heidegger meant by nihilism. Yes. In his conversations with Ernst Jünger, I think it was, he, he talks about how Europe must inevitably pass through a period of nihilism. You know, I mean, it's not that it's good or bad, it's just inevitable. Uh, you know, the question is whether it will come out the other side or not. Yes. Something to that effect, I yes. think. Now, I read that long, long ago before I ever tried to read Heidegger's texts, but, um, you know, the leftists who have a prior investment in the idea that Nazism and Hitler in particular were nihilists from their point of view. They insist that Hitler had no principles, no values, no ideals, that he was simply uh, a manipulator. And, you know, massive false texts like the uh, um, Hannah Rachman's conversations with Hitler were produced yes. more specifically to sell this idea that Hitler was a soulless manipulator. So leftists having that background when they read Heidegger's remarks about this period of nihilism, they think that it's the Hitler period he's referring to. But in fact, it's precisely the opposite. Mm. Heidegger, I think, saw Nazism as a defense of Europe against nihilism. I mean, nihilism is related to communism in the thought of that period. That communism is a reduction of, not just of ethics, but of all philosophical categories to zero. You know? So the fight against nihilism, in his mind, would have been very similar to the fight against communism in Hitler's mind. It's also, yes, and it's also 
relates to aesthetic ideas within religiosity. Yeah. Um, a soul or an inner consciousness, let's say, a higher inner consciousness, fights against non-belief, against doubt, against unbelief, and so does a civilization. It wrestles with the prospect of meaning as absence. Because if you can't have that counter-proposition before you, like darkness and light, or life and death, you can't think without an oppositional polarity. Much Western thinking proceeds oppositionally, proceeds by wrestling with that which needs to be overcome. Because the idea of nihilism, which in itself is also a very complicated idea, because is it possible for any period of time for a group or even an individual to sustain what nihilism really means? The prospect of believing that everything is purposeless. Even the Sartrean idea that you step back from purposelessness and volitionalise it through commitment. Again, is a denial of nihilism. He's gone there and doesn't want to stay. Well, the relationship with communism might lie in, in materialism, because you probably won't agree here, because you said something that suggested you're a materialist yourself. Right? Well, a Nietzsche. Well, but I mean, the person who comes to mind is not really an ideal example, but Grenoll who argue, yeah. argues that materialism in the reign of quantity of books like that, the materialism is, is really a, a stage in the process of reduction of the, of the universe to absolutely zero, to nil. I mean, matter is the last stop before nothingness. Yes, how I dig it is within the discourse of continental advanced Western philosophizing, a perennialist mm. and a traditionalist, really, um, for whom the most agreeable semiotic of truth and purpose probably would be the Catholicism of his youth. But in actual fact, he doesn't want to get belaboured by that. He would much rather approach the entire question theoretically. Yes, that um, the, the interesting thing for most, for most of our species, though, is that, uh, look at the Muslim world now. One truth, one purpose, Death for those who are excluded from it, at least in accordance with certain definitions of it, in a militant, vanguard way. And that is a type of militantly essentialist thinking that the Western mind, in my view, can't encompass. Because it's not that it's cretinous, it's just it's not the way we perceive reality. <coughs> Even the most, you see, I mean, uh, I know certain Catholics who, one or two, became Muslims after Vatican II. They left the Catholic Church because they wanted an absolute structure. They didn't want any revisionism, if you like, within Christianity at all. They had to have total and utter certainty. And these were advanced people. They're not people lying in the sand being told what to think. By the locusts up there with a the beard. You know, these are, these are people who almost need that degree of certainty. Most people are comfortable with no certainty at all. Liberals can, li can live with unbelievable areas of uncertainty, even the language they use. They'll say, well, I do agree with you, but on the other hand, there's this proposition here, but he's got another view, and of course that needs to be canvassed for reasons of inclusion, and they're hopping all over, because they can never uh, draw it down. Sometimes materiality is necessary, actually, to deal with elements of um, casuistry and relativism at the moment. Do you see what I mean? That it's part of a concretization, because liberalism itself has become so deconstructive, even of itself, because I think contemporary postmodern liberal ideas are devouring themselves at a level of theory. They're eating themselves up, and of course there will come a moment when you do eat yourself completely, and you need the only way to go forwards, the interesting notion of the avant-garde in the last 200 years, the only way to go forwards will be to go back can't go forwards any further. So if you're ever going to progress at all, and we believe in the idea that we should progress, in that sense I've always resisted the, re the notion that people, to the, well to the right of that which is regarded as centuries, or even moderately right wing, are reactionaries. Mm. We want to progress in another area and go in another direction. And I personally think that these philosophical matters are of crucial importance, which is why at the material and political level, if you want to use this terminology, Heidegger made an extreme choice. And although an anti-existentialist theoretically, look at the choice he made, because that choice in 1933 wasn't just a fitting synergy with the regime that had come in. It was, a, it was a sort of a total choice, a religious choice, really. 
and I suppose there was partiality for the governments in both Germany and Italy, probably deep down more the one in Germany than in Italy, really, was of a similar order. I think Evelo said several things, that in creation to modernity, there were several responses, one of which was to just join in, I suppose. One was to kill yourself and have a damn with it. One was to ground yourself in the essential purpose of prior traditions which are transcendental in character. And the other is mm. Nietzscheanism, let's put it that way, sort of power morality and the prospect of self-transcendence outside systems in a world where all systems have collapsed or seem to have collapsed. Well, I gather Italian fascism is much more based on Hegel by uh, Giovanni Gentile. That's right. So that's a big difference there. Right? Yes. Hegel, you said there's a kind of a postscript about Hegel there. Criticising him, yes. But, um, you know, I mean, it is still possible to take Hegel seriously, in my view. Yes, the Italians did, and... What's the Hegel price postscript? Ah, let's have a look. Well, Hegel undermines what Heidegger was saying. No, that Hegel uh, had interesting ideas about the conception of time and of the ideas between time and spirit, Geist. Uh, but at the same time, in some ways, Nietzsche, um, Heidegger, in a, in a crude way, is playing wrist. Someone who's got a good hand, but he produces an ace at the end of his book and puts it down to say, I won this round, you know. So there's a little bit of that. And that's, in a sense, Heidegger's human element, if you want to put it human. The humanism of a non-humanist, if you like. The, uh, the fact he did care what other intellectuals said about him and went to war ferociously against other detractors, of whom there are many. Adorno was asked by a woman at a party once, she said, well, at least Heidegger, Professor Adorno, has placed man before death. And he said, Ludendorff did that. <laughs> you know, which is a good answer, you know, but so what? You know, it's just salon talk, isn't it, really? You know, and, and in a way, Adorno is another rival absolute. Adorno sits there, you've seen his new left photos of him with one hand cupped in his face, saying it's all misery. The culture industry is everywhere. Everything is destroyed. Interesting streak of cultural conservatism in this high Marxist, if you like. And Adorno's there, poetry after Auschwitz shouldn't even be permitted, which is one of his famous lines, you know, from Minimum Moravia. We, we should have no glory again because there's been a few massacres. Well, the Heidegger's response would be, if you bother to look at these things at all, that massacres just have speeded up process anyway. You know, because um, life will end in the massacre of death, if you like. So there's a degree to which that would, he would regard that as a moralistic and slightly bitter-minded remark outside the scope of true study, basically, you know, and toss him this. But um, anyone else got any questions as the glasses are collected? I think, um, thank you very much, Jonathan. Right. Bye. Bye.